from KLCC Studios, this is Oregon on the Record. I'm Michael Dunn, representing every city from Adams to Yahats and representing diverse interests from downtown Portland to the tiny towns in eastern Oregon. Soon, the 2024 Oregon Legislature will be gaveled into session. What will happen this next session, and will it be as controversial as last year's? Today on Oregon on the Record, you'll hear from two experts who will help us break down what happened last session and help us look ahead. It's a short session of only two months, but there are ambitious plans to fund housing, adjust the state's drug policy, and address wildfire danger, among others. Our two guests, Dirk Vanderhart of KLCC and Julia Shumway of the Oregon Capital Chronicle, will both discuss the political landscape impacting decisions in Salem, as well as give you their best guess as to what will happen this session. The 2023 session was a bit bonkers. So will we see a repeat of that in the 2024 short session? Time, of course, will tell. But in the meantime, you're going to hear from two folks who are very plugged into the legislature, and they're going to give you their assessment of what we might expect beginning the first week of February. Despite its brevity, there's a lot the legislature needs to get done this year, and our experts, Dirk Vanderhart of KLCC and Julia Shumway of the Oregon Capital Chronicle, are going to preview it for you starting now. Julia Shumway, Deputy Editor at the Oregon Capital Chronicle, and Dirk Vanderhart of KLCC, thanks to you both for coming on and chatting. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Hey, um, boy. Before we look forward, uh, let's let's kind of maybe take a, a few minutes to look back on the last legislative session. Maybe uh, I'll start with you, Julia. Talk about some of your uh, whatever we want to call them highlights or lowlights of the last legislative session. Yeah, I'd say there there were a lot of lowlights. Okay. Obviously, we had the longest longest walkout in state history that kind of ground the legislature to a halt for six weeks in the middle of session. Yeah. So they started off really strong, passed um, major funding for housing and semiconductors in the first part of session, then essentially had six weeks where very little work could get done and finished up with a mad rush to pass bills at the end. So they eventually managed to accomplish most of what um, legislative leaders set out to accomplish, but it was a very tense session. Yeah, yeah, I bet. What about you? Yeah, I, you know, I think Julia hit the highlights. I mean, what I would say is as a result of that really long walkout, a couple things happened. One was that Democrats were forced to strip back some of the contentious legislation that they were pursuing that actually led to that walkout. You may remember there were gun safety rules that really had to be pared back. There was um, a, a bill about abortion restrictions and transgender care that was was pared back. So that really did affect the outcome of the session. And it also created a dynamic that I think is going to follow us into this next session, which is that when Senate Republicans or most Senate Republicans walked out for six, six weeks, they triggered the ballot measure that, that voters had put into place in 2022 that basically indicates or, or we think it may indicate that they might not be able to run again. Now, we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, and, and maybe we can talk about that later, but it does create a dynamic in the, the current session or the session we're expecting that they feel like they maybe don't have a ton to lose. They, their trigger for walking out might be all the all the lighter, mm -hmm. all the the threshold might be all the lower because they've already, in theory, triggered whatever penalties are going to exist. So I, I think we will see reverberations from that um, continuing on into this session. Yeah. Well, you just said we'll get to it later, but let let's let's take a few minutes to talk about that. And you know, Julia, I'll go back to you. You know. <laughs> A lot of voters thought, OK, this measure passed because we want the legislature to do their job. And it seemed like they didn't listen to us as voters. And uh, one one group took that walk out as, as, as Dirk just laid out. You know, talk about I imagine, you know, in talking to fellow journalists or just fellow voters, what do you think the mood is in the state about what happened when they apparently disobeyed that 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 uh, that that voter passed initiative and walked out right I'd say there is that there's a lot of frustration among voters even voters in in these Republican districts they also uh, across the state supported this measure to 
prevent lawmakers from using the, the walkout as a tool. Mm -hmm. But there is also frustration from Republican primary voters with Republicans in the House who did not participate in the walkout, who stayed and voiced their opposition to these Democratic bills, but ultimately stayed in Salem and allowed them to pass. We saw it during the end of the session last year that a number of House Republicans talked about the vitriolic emails they were receiving from their voters. Mm -hmm. And I think they're also under pressure to to stand up for some of their voters' priorities. Senate mm -hmm. leader Tim Canope has said a few times that he doesn't know if we'll necessarily have a session. He may be much quicker to pull that trigger of walking out if Republicans aren't getting what they want to see from session. Wow, wow. Let me introduce our guests. I'm talking to Julia Shumway. She's the deputy editor of the Oregon Capital Chronicle and KLCC's Dirk Vanderhart. Dirk, I'm going to ask you, is this different than maybe it was even just a few years ago? Or, or is it just that, um, you know, maybe there's just more attention on behavior from legislators? Well, I, to the extent that you are talking about legislative walkouts, um, there absolutely are more legislative walkouts than there have ever been. Mm -hmm. You know, there there are a number of reasons why we're seeing that. The first is that obviously polarization uh, in the nation and Oregon is very, very high right now. People aren't finding a lot of common grounds. And in some ways, um, politically, you know, it behooves a politician to to sort of lean into that or, or even if it they wouldn't naturally lean into that. Maybe they are sort of forced to lean into those differences because that's what the electorate wants. And we have partisan primaries and, and any number of things. But I think maybe the, the bigger factor here is, is go back to the 2018 elections. Um, that was when Republicans gave up more ground than they had in a long time in both chambers. They were suddenly in super minorities in the House and Senate. As Carl Wilson, the former House Republican leader, told me ahead of the 2019 session, um, he felt like Republicans were essentially legislative speed bumps. In other words, hmm. Democrats could pass literally any bill they wanted on a party line vote. They could pass new taxes. They could pass policy bills without needing a single Republican vote. Hmm. And so I, I think that has created a dynamic among Republicans where they are looking about for any tool they have um, to block some of these proposals that their constituents uh, and, you know, they certainly oppose. I mean, we, we see this a lot with uh, gun control laws. There have been talked about walkouts or, or, or actual walkouts. We've seen it with climate control legislator, mm -hmm. climate change legislation, I should say. Um, but any number of things the Republicans are arguing, you know, this is a tool in the Constitution. And, and maybe we should, Michael, back up and just explain to folks how this works, right? Perfect. Because I think yes. it can be confusing. Um, you know, Oregon has a two-thirds quorum requirement, meaning two-thirds of members in both chambers need to be present in order for that chamber to conduct any business. And since Democrats have a majority, but not a two-thirds majority, they can't conduct business in either chamber without at least some Republicans present. Hmm. So that's the tool that Republicans are manipulating. And the ballot measure we keep referring to attempted to sort of do away with that tool. And we should get into that as well. What that ballot measure said is that any lawmaker that has 10 or more unexcused absences in a session cannot run for reelection at some point in the future. That was an attempt to force Republicans to essentially be in their seat to grant Democrats quorum um, lest their political careers come to an end. So I, I want to make sure that we're being clear about yeah. what we're talking about, not to confuse folks. What do you think? Do you think that this that this specter of Republican walkouts is, is going to just, I mean, happen as soon as they get back in session? And also explain to Dirk did a great job of explaining this, the, the, you know, how we got here. Can you also explain why we're going into such a short session that's only going to last, what, two months? Yeah, right? that 35 days in total. So that's also thanks to a thanks to a constitutional change up until a few years ago, Oregon, the Oregon legislature met every other year. And that would be a, a long session in a year. They, they'd pass a budget. They'd pass all these bills. They might come back in special sessions if there were emergencies. Uh, your listeners might remember some of that, especially during the COVID pandemic, sure. lawmakers coming back frequently to, to pass emergency legislation. And a number of years ago, voters approved a constitutional amendment that said that lawmakers can meet for six months in odd numbered years and about a month, 35 days in even numbered years with the idea that what they're doing in even numbered years is just 
kind of uh, emergencies, okay. responding to things that they cannot wait another year to to work on. And that has always been a sticking point, especially with Republicans and the minority party. They see Democrats come out with grand plans for things they want to accomplish in this month long session and say, hey, wait a minute, we should only be doing like quick budget fixes and, and emergency legislation. Why are we, for, for instance, in the, in the previous short session that we had, why are we making a huge sweeping change to farm worker overtime? Hmm. And so that may be a, a sticking point this year. A, again, if we're looking at very large budgetary asks from, for instance, from the governor who wants at least $500 million for housing, that kind of new policy changes, sweeping changes, to the state's land use laws. That's not typically the kind of thing you'd see happen in, in just a month worth of time in Salem. So, yeah, but I, I, I will say, you know, I, I think that um, the other thing that the walkouts have done and, and the specter of another walkout is causing is some restraint. It, this is my theory right now, and, and obviously predictions are meant to be sort of proven wrong, but <laughs> it, it does sound like Democrats are going to have to force some restraint on themselves hmm. um, for what subject matters come up in the next session, because if they bring up you know, a gun safety bill, if they bring up an abortion bill, if they bring up something about you know forcing companies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, all these things that we know tend to be third rails, like it's very hard not to see Republicans walking. But the things we are hearing about them taking up housing production, um, you know, somehow addressing the public safety and, and treatment services of this addiction crisis we're in, do seem to be at least broadly bipartisan, if not really in their details. And I think that is is likely going to ensure that folks stick together and stay in the building. Uh, again, that's uh, a prediction that could easily be proven wrong, but that's how it feels to me. Julia, talk about, you know, again, it's a short session, supposed to be emergencies, but but as I understand it, like the governor has a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, emphasis on on homelessness and, and a big budget item. Maybe talk about some of the big things that you see, you know, them trying to introduce and, and, and get past this short session. Yeah, so the governor laid out her plan for homelessness and housing. You know, last session was very much focused on homelessness. They started the year with 200 million for shelters and and eviction prevention and then followed it up adding almost another billion dollars in funding for housing and homelessness. This year she's coming in, she wants about 600 million, 500 million of that for building more housing, another 100 million for um, eviction prevention, uh, keeping shelters running. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a very big budgetary ask. And we're seeing some of the focus shift from strictly affordable housing, the kind of subsidized housing for people who are making um, a, a very small amount of money, less uh, less than the poverty level, to a, to a focus on both affordable housing and middle income or, or workforce housing. That's for people like your your police officers, your teachers, your your journalists, um, people who are working professionals earning about the median income, but are not making enough that they can afford to buy homes or easily rent homes in most of Oregon. And so there's a, a big plan that um, COTEC is, has been working on. And Senator Dick Anderson, who's kind of the Republican voice on housing in the Senate, has been working on to come up with a revolving loan fund um, with a few hundred million dollars from the legislature to incentivize building homes that can be bought by, say, families who are making in that like 60,000 to 120,000 um, range okay. of of income. Yeah, yeah. Boy, Dirk, you mentioned earlier that this 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 is the kind of thing that that might get some bipartisan consensus ha handicap this. Do you do you think this is this is do you think this 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 bill this 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 emphasis by the governor do you think it has traction and 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 could be successful this short legislative session? Okay, so I'm I'm making predictions again. I you see. are. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I think it's successful. He, the the politics around this are super interesting, right? Because Everyone agrees, as I noted, that housing production is important. And actually, Kotec recently has parted company with other Democrats on this subject. One reason this bill that she's putting forward is so interesting is because at the end of last year's session, she had a bill that would have been essentially her big housing production bill of the year. Mm -hmm. And it would have done some things that actually Republicans really, really liked. And a lot of Democrats had a lot of heartburn 
around. That was this provision that would have allowed cities to unilaterally sort of rope more land into their urban growth boundaries as long as that land was being used for housing and as long as a certain subset of that housing was being made affordable. Um, this was something, as I said, that Democrats kind of had the jitters about because Oregon has these really historic vaunted land use laws sure. that Democrats are, are usually pretty high on. There's a lot of advocacy groups that really defend this stuff and, and we're very much not big fans of the proposal. And so on the final day of session, um, Kotex bill last year uh, came up for a vote in the Senate and enough Democrats opposed it actually that it failed by one vote. So mm. she is now bringing this proposal back. And the question is going to be whether or not she's made enough changes to, to her proposal. I mean, certainly there are some new aspects of it and Julia mentioned one or two of them, but whether or not the central you know, policy uh, proposal about roping land into urban growth boundaries and and sort of the partisan um, mix of folks that like or don't like that has changed at all. Even if it hasn't, I would suggest that Kotex bill has a really good chance of passing because last year um, there were some Republicans gone on that final day in the Senate. If even one of those Republicans was there, probably her bill passes. I'm guessing that's the same this year. And I'm guessing, especially with some of the changes she's made, um, this thing is likely to pass. Now, I'm not sure the legislature is going to fund it to the degree that she wants, which, as Julia mentioned, she wants about $500 million for housing. Sure, sure. Let me introduce our guests. I'm talking to Julia Shumway. She's the deputy editor of the Oregon Capital Chronicle and KLCC's Dirk Vanderhart. Uh, Julia, you know, I know we could spend a lot of time on on that past issue, but let's talk about Measure 110 and, and the legalization of drugs. I, I know that uh, it sounds like a lot of the legislature wants to tweak it to change it what, what are you hearing about measure 110 yeah so democrats um, are still finalizing some of their plans for what they want to do but they definitely want to make some tweaks to measure 110 they're stopping short of a repeal which is a proposal republicans have that is essentially dead on arrival at the legislature but what we may what we will likely see is the is a proposal to recriminalize possession of small amounts of drugs as we all know uh, measure 110 eliminated criminal penalties for drug possession um, hmm. and instead encouraged people to go to treatment but stopped short of mandating that treatment okay. um, this proposal the new proposal would make this would make uh, drug possession a class C misdemeanor that's about 30 days in jail. Um, and we'll also probably see more funding for things like recovery housing and, and drug courts and some other legal tweaks. Um, there's a specific Supreme Court decision, Oregon Supreme Court decision, that um, makes it a lot harder to, char to charge um, people who are dealing drugs, that you act, the police actually have to catch them in the act of dealing drugs, not just find someone with a whole bunch of drugs and individual baggies that they're clearly going to deal okay. to be able to charge them with dealing. And so that's one of the changes we'll probably see. Okay. Anything to add for, uh, on that on that particular issue, Dirk? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, this, this for me is, you know, housing's big. I think this is going to be the most fascinating debate of the session. Um, just last year, uh, you know, we had a, a session, a six month session where Republicans virtually the whole time were were crying out for some sort of I mean, they want to measure 110 repeal, as, as Julia said, but sure. they offered varying sort of options for how that might look. And, and all we heard from Democrats um, all year was, no, absolutely not. We're not going there. We're going to try to make some tweaks that help measure 110 move forward more successfully. But we are not willing to make any sort of meaningful changes to the law that voters passed in 2020. Now we are hearing a, a very, very different thing from legislators. Um, Democrats are willing to sort of trim and, and make cuts to the things that voters put forward in Measure 110. And that's because voters now aren't very happy with Measure 110. Hmm. They, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, I think anyone that's looking at this honestly cannot blame the woes that Oregon is seeing in terms of you know rising overdoses or public drug use solely on Measure 110. Sure. Certainly other cities and, and states are seeing these issues, but it has coincided with rising overdoses and the spread of fentanyl and the pandemic and all these things that have made conditions really worrisome to a lot of people when they see them on their streets. And so now we have Democrats. I think you can't really understate uh, how surprised some people have been to see Democrats actually floating, um, bringing back 
class C misdemeanors. It's the lowest criminal charge you can get in Oregon, but still a criminal charge for possession. And there are going to be people vociferously arguing against that and, and having some pretty powerful arguments about the things that um, being involved in the criminal justice system can mean for people trying to beat addiction and whether or not that's counterproductive or whether or not we have public defenders to handle this or any number of things. And at the same time, there are going to be DAs and law enforcement officers saying this doesn't go far enough and it's not going to offer some of the relief that lawmakers hope. So, you know, this is a extremely tough subject and it will be a really passionate debate and and you know this is not one where i would predict hmm. um what this law looks like at the end of session because i think a lot can happen in 35 days sure sure julie i'm going to give you the last word other than these big ones we've just talked about is there any other things you're looking at in the last minute we have uh uh, uh for this short session of the 2024 legislative session um, this is a, a perennial issue, one that I don't think we'll see solved this year, but I'm always interested in seeing what lawmakers intend to do around campaign finance reform. Hmm. Um, it's something that House Speaker Dan Rayfield had said he or has insisted is a priority for him. It's his last session in the legislature. There's going to be once again dueling um, initiatives before voter potentially going before voters in November. And we want to see if the legislature gets ahead of this in any way. Got it. Got it. Well, both of you, I, I'm sure it, it, when this session ends, I'm going to have you back and we can we can kind of figure out how they did. Uh, Julia Shumway, deputy editor of the Oregon Capital Chronicle and KLCC's Dirk Vanderhart. Thank you both so much for coming on and, 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 and talking with us. My pleasure, thank Michael. You. That's our show. The job of a senator and representative is hard. There's so much to do, and in many cases, so much riding on their decisions. And even though both houses are controlled by one party, there's a lot that can and does happen to gum up the works. A good and productive session is often described as a situation where no one leaves Salem completely happy. Time will tell, albeit a brief period of time in this short session, whether or not the 2024 Oregon Legislative Session is a good one or not. I want to thank both Dirk Vanderhart of KLCC and Julia Shumway of the Oregon Capital Chronicle for coming on the show to share their expertise and wisdom. This show, along with all episodes of Oregon on the Record, is available at klcc.org. I'm Michael Dunn, and this has been Oregon on the Record. Thanks for listening.